the language of atomic warfare. The atomic age has moved forward at such a pace that every citizen of the world should have some comprehension, at least in comparative terms, of the extent of this development, of the utmost significance to every one of us. Clearly, if the peoples of the world are to conduct an intelligent search for peace, they must be armed with the significant facts of today's existence. here is the command ship of Joint Task Force 132. We have minutes to go before the first blast, mic shot, of Operation Idol. Uh, 59 minutes now to be exact. We've been here since daybreak. Let we talk last night during the early morning hours. Now as you can imagine, Feeling is running pretty high about now, and there's reason for it. If everything goes according to plan, we'll soon see the largest explosion ever set off on the face of the Earth. The largest explosion ever set off on the face of the Earth. The largest explosion ever set off on the face of the Earth. The largest explosion ever set off on the face of the Earth. The largest explosion ever set off on the face of the Earth. The largest explosion ever set off. of the world are to conduct an intelligent search for peace, they must be armed with the significant facts of today's existence. The atoms of uranium and plutonium are among the heaviest. Heavy because the nucleus of each atom contains large numbers of the fundamental particles called protons and neutrons. When a free neutron hits this nucleus, it splits into two parts, releasing more neutrons which may go on to split other nuclei. The resulting fission products become highly radioactive, emitting the long-range and dangerous gamma rays. The split nucleus weighs less than the full one, and this difference in weight is released in the form of energy, nuclear energy. It follows from the special theory of relativity that mass and energy are food are but different manifestations of the same thing. Furthermore, the equation E is equal mc squared, in which energy is but equal to mass multiplied with the square of the velocity of light, showed that very small amount of mass may be converted into a very large amount of energy and with the rest. This is the largest fireball ever produced. At its maximum, it measures about three and one quarter miles in diameter. Compared to the skyline of New York, this means that with the Empire State Building as zero point, the Mike Fireball would extend downtown to Washington Square and uptown to Central Park. In other words, the Fireball alone would engulf about one quarter of the island of Manhattan. The tremendous upsurge of air from the detonation rapidly pushes up the mic cloud. Again, nothing of this height and width has ever before been witnessed. If the picture is stopped at this point in the cloud's growth, the height of the cloud is approximately 40,000 feet. This means that 32 Empire State buildings, at 1,250 feet per building, could be piled one on top of the other before they would attain the cloud's height at this time, roughly two minutes after zero. Some 10 minutes later, the cloud approaches its maximum. At this time, the mushroom portion of the cloud has pushed up to around 10 miles and spreads out along the base of the stratosphere to a width of about 100 miles. 
while the stem itself is pushed upward deep into the stratosphere to a height of about 25 miles. The results of this tremendous power can be shown at the atoll. Here is an aerial photo of the test area of the atoll before the blast. And here is the same area after the blast, showing the crater caused by mud. The crater is roughly a mile in diameter, when it is illustrated that some 14 Pentagon buildings could be comfortably accommodated in this hole. The size of the mite crater becomes more real. In profile, the crater gradually slopes down to a maximum depth of some 175 feet, or equivalent to the height of a 17-story building. The lateral destructive effects are the greatest jet observed from a single explosive device. Without getting into the areas of target evaluation or secondary effects, it can be safely assumed that there was complete annihilation within a radius of three miles, or out to and including all of engines, that there was severe to moderate damage out to seven miles or down to Rougeau, and that light damage extended as far as ten miles or down to run. Every thinking person fears nuclear war, and every technological nation plans for it. Everyone knows its madness, and every country has an excuse. There's a dreary chain of causality. The Germans were working on the bomb at the beginning of World War II, so the Americans had to make one first. If the Americans had one, the Russians had to have one. Then the British, the French, the Chinese, the Indians, the Pakistanis, many nations now collect nuclear weapons. The bomb dropped on Hiroshima killed 70,000 people in a full nuclear exchange in the paroxysm of global death. The equivalent of a million Hiroshima bombs would be dropped all over the world. How would we explain all this to a dispassionate extraterrestrial observer? What account would we give of our stewardship of the planet Earth? We have heard the rationales offered by the superpowers. We know who speaks for the nations, but who speaks for the human species? Who speaks for Earth? If we're willing to live with the growing likelihood of nuclear war, shouldn't we also be willing to explore vigorously every possible means to prevent nuclear war? Shouldn't we consider in every nation major changes in the traditional ways of doing things, a fundamental restructuring of economic, political, social, and religious institutions? A new consciousness is developing which sees the Earth as a single organism and recognizes that an organism at war with itself is doomed. We are one planet. 